Mackenzie Lewick was born into a Mormon family in Southern California on March the 8th, 1996. Along with her parents, Gregory and Diana, Mackenzie and her three brothers grew up in sunny El Segundo, about 20 miles or 32 kilometers southwest of downtown Los Angeles. Mackenzie was also active and physically fit, and she loved being in and around water. In addition to swimming and playing water polo in high school, she and Kara often rode their bikes to the Manhattan Beach Pier to chat, drink coffee, or just gaze out at the ocean. By all accounts, Mackenzie loved her family, her friends, and her idyllic Southern California life. She even found time to support worthwhile causes like breast cancer awareness. But as she got older, she longed to spread her wings and broaden her horizons. Mackenzie applied at a number of colleges, but after graduating high school in 2014, she moved 700 miles or 1,100 kilometers north to Salt Lake City to attend the University of Utah. Mackenzie entered the university's pre-nursing program with a focus on kinesiology, and she was even considering going on to medical school after getting her nursing degree. She also had a part-time job at a local laboratory and joined the Alpha Chi Omega sorority. Mackenzie was always on the go, and during her college years, her faith seemed to fall by the wayside. She and many of her sorority sisters regularly stayed out late, drank alcohol, and dated casually. According to one close friend, Mackenzie also had two serious boyfriends during college. It's not clear when it happened or why, but at some point she became active on a number of dating and hookup apps and websites like Tinder and Seeking Arrangement. Seeking Arrangement was founded in 2006 as a platform where older successful men, known as sugar daddies, could connect with attractive young women known as sugar babies. This was totally out of character for the traditional Mormon girl from El Segundo, or at least that's what everyone thought. Then again, they may have been her way of asserting her independence after growing up in such a traditional Mormon home. Either way, young women around the country have been turning to hookup apps and websites in recent years to make extra money for everything from food to rent to tuition and higher dollar vacations. These relationships sometimes involve the exchange of money and other items of value for sexual favors, but that is not always the case. According to a few of Mackenzie's closest friends, she regularly exchanged explicit photos and text messages with these men from those sites. She even met some of them for in-person dates. Her motivation may have been financial. Then again, these illicit communications and trysts may have satisfied desires that weren't being fulfilled in her more traditional relationships. Whatever the case, she was being more adventurous than she had been back home. Mackenzie Lewick and Iola Ejahe first communicated through Seeking Arrangement in 2018. It's unclear what they chatted about or whether Ayula passed himself off as a wealthy sugar daddy, but they stopped communicating on June the 16th of 2019 when Ayula texted Mackenzie out of the blue. By then, Mackenzie had deleted their previous text and didn't remember Ayula, so she responded with a question mark. Shortly thereafter, he texted her two words, seeking arrangement. But, as I said, Mackenzie still didn't remember him, so she asked him to send her a picture, which he did. Ayula said that Mackenzie immediately stopped replying after he sent the photo of himself. He assumed that she just wasn't into black men, but the two apparently resumed their communication later on. A few hours later, early in the morning of Monday, June the 17th, 2019, Mackenzie touched down at Salt Lake City International Airport she had spent a few days in El Segundo attending her grandmother's funeral, and she texted her parents at approximately 1 a.m. to let them know that she had landed safely. She booked a car through Lyft. When driver Michael Canada arrived, Mackenzie told him to take her to Hatch Park on West Center Street, about five minutes northeast of the airport. On the drive, Mackenzie made a comment about how strange it was she was going to a park so early in the morning. 
Michael agreed, but she said that she was just meeting a friend. When they arrived, a dark vehicle was already in the lot. Michael parked nearby, but this is where things get a little hazy. According to one source, he said that a woman got out of the car, walked over to Mackenzie and greeted her warmly like they knew each other. But other sources claim there was no other woman. Instead, they claim that Michael helped Mackenzie put her bags in the trunk of the other car before getting back into his own vehicle and leaving. Whatever the case, he didn't see if there was anyone else in the car. As far as Michael knew, Mackenzie and her supposed friend drove off shortly thereafter. Nonetheless, he could not shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right and that his early morning passenger may have made a horrible error in judgment. Mackenzie failed to show up at work or for any of her classes after June the 17th. Her parents texted multiple times, but by then her phone had either gone dead or been shut off. After the 17th, nobody saw Mackenzie. She was not active on social media and her beloved pets were left unattended in her apartment all of which were suspicious and totally out of character. By Thursday the 20th of June, her distraught father finally called the Salt Lake City Police Department and reported her missing. Mackenzie's friends, family members, and even her sorority sisters were worried sick, but they didn't just sit by and let the police handle everything. Instead, they distributed thousands of flyers around the park and organized scores of volunteers who showed up to search the area around Hatch Park. Everyone tried to stay positive, but another recent incident was still fresh in their minds. Less than a year before, in late October of 2018, a beautiful young woman named Lauren McCluskey was shot and killed on the University of Utah campus by a disturbed young man that she had briefly dated. We did a story on that case as well. There wasn't any indication at this point that foul play was involved in Mackenzie's disappearance. However, her friends told investigators everything they knew about her involvement on dating and hookup apps and websites such as Tinder and Seeking Arrangement. They also admitted that Mackenzie exchanged sexually oriented messages and explicit photos with users and that she had even met some in person. Mackenzie's father also told investigators that she recently opened a new bank account and got another credit card that he was not initially aware of. After clearing the Lyft driver, Michael Canada, of any wrongdoing, investigators began focusing on Mackenzie's phone, text, and email communications. And, unsurprisingly, Ayula Ajahe's name kept popping up. Ayula was cooperative when detectives stopped by his home less than a week after Mackenzie went missing. Initially, he denied even knowing her. Then, on June the 24th, the case took an unexpected twist when Ayula Ajahe walked into the Salt Lake City Police Department unannounced. At this point, he was not under arrest and didn't have a lawyer. But after taking him into a quiet interrogation room, the investigator told him that Mackenzie's parents were worried sick and asked him to put himself in their position. I know it's not good when people are missing. Every time they are missing, it's putting their family into confusion of what, what they are doing, what is going on. So think about that for a second. Put yourself in their shoes and then start being honest with me. But before the interview officially began, the investigator asked Ayula if he was willing to talk without an attorney present. Ayula agreed. At least in the beginning, it looked like he just wanted to help the police clear up the whole sordid matter once and for all. He even gave investigators the passwords to his phone, laptop, and security system, but the real motive behind his visit may have been to establish an alibi. Ayula claimed that he was with his baby mama that night. There's a security camera in my living room. So and when I view it, I was there the whole time that night. And then, just like I just showed you today, my baby mama was with me, and she's pregnant. By then, police had camera footage showing a dark four-door vehicle that looked a lot like his 2013 Kia Optima leaving the Hatch Park just after 3 a.m. on June the 17th. 
Ayula could not explain why his car was there that night, but he admitted to texting McKenzie multiple times that morning. Later, the investigators told him that they already had McKenzie's phone records and that they didn't really jibe with his story. AJ, I just told you that your phone records and the location put you up at the meet. Do you think honestly and expect me to believe that you ended that conversation and somehow you and her and her location end up in the exact same spot? Oh, I'm not doubting you. If I see that too, if I'm in your case, I would be asking myself, what are you asking me right now? It's not a miraculous question. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay. Stuff doesn't just happen. No. Ayula said that he was telling the truth and that he knew it was a crime to lie to the police. As the interview progressed, Ayula became concerned about the time and said he was supposed to meet his baby mama hours before. But ironically, he told investigators that he didn't know her last name, even though she was eight months pregnant with his child. By now, Ayula probably realized that his surprise visit to the police department was a big mistake. In fact, he told investigators that he just wanted the whole thing to be over, and at one point, medics had been called because he began hyperventilating. When his breathing stabilized, investigators employed a classic interrogation technique. They left him alone in the interrogation room for more than an hour. It may seem counterintuitive, but being left alone can be even more stressful and exhausting than the actual interrogation because the suspect's mind will inevitably go in a million directions at once. At one point, Ayula gives in to the exhaustion and rests his head on the table. Later, he lays down on the floor and appears to fall asleep. Yet, despite the mountain of evidence against him, he was released the following morning. At a press conference two days later on June the 26th, Salt Lake City Police Chief Mike Brown told reporters that detectives had just served a search warrant at Ayula Ajaye's home in Fair Park. Is there anyone else in there? Let's make sure. During the search, a cadaver dog led officers to human bone fragments, charred muscular tissue, part of a scalp, a cell phone, a burnt wallet, and other personal items that were later shown to belong to Mackenzie. This is the suspect's backyard. Right here is where police dug multiple holes in the ground. It's here where cops say they found charred human tissue matching Mackenzie's DNA. They also found personal items that were burned belonging to Mackenzie. Tissue samples taken from the premises matched Mackenzie's DNA. And with such overwhelming evidence against him, Ayula was detained at his home on Thursday, June the 27th of 2019. The following day, he was arrested and charged with kidnapping, aggravated murder, obstruction of justice, and desecrating Mackenzie's body. Shortly after his arrest, Ayula buckled under the pressure and confessed to abducting and murdering Mackenzie. He even admitted to turning off his video cameras before leaving home that morning so there wouldn't be any proof that she had ever been there. Of course, this meant the murder was premeditated. According to Ayula, he secured Mackenzie's hands behind her back with rope and zip ties shortly after they entered his home. Next, he straddled her and tried to choke her, but it wouldn't work no matter how much pressure he applied. 
Mackenzie repeatedly begged him to stop and let her go, but he rolled her over onto her stomach and strangled her from behind until she stopped breathing. Afterward, he burned her body and some of her personal items were there, all dumped into a shallow grave in his backyard, and he disposed of some of her possessions in the Jordan River. The next day, he doused Mackenzie's body with gasoline in an attempt to burn it to ash to cover up his heinous crime. However, her body did not burn as thoroughly as he thought it would. Since he knew he was the prime suspect and that investigators already knew his story probably wasn't true, he decided to dig up Mackenzie's remains and move them to remote areas of the Logan Canyon, about 85 miles or 136 kilometers to the north, where he didn't think they would be discovered. Nonetheless, he led investigators to the site on July the 3rd, where the last grisly piece of the puzzle finally fell into place. Ayula Ajaye was born in Nigeria in 1988, but aside from that, little is known about his life before his immigration to the United States. However, we do know that Ayula had a student visa in early 2009 when he arrived in Logan, Utah to attend Utah State University. He met an outgoing young Mormon missionary named Logan Dill on campus shortly after arriving, and the two hit it off immediately. Dill described Ayula as a happy-go-lucky young man with a great sense of humor, and after a whirlwind conversion, he was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Ayula studied at Utah State University for nearly two years, but in the summer of 2011, he moved to Dallas, Texas, and met a woman named Tanisha Jenkins. Ayula and Tanisha got married in 2014, but she didn't join him when he returned to Utah shortly after the wedding. The newlyweds maintained a long-distance relationship for a number of years, but Tanisha refused to move to Utah, and she described her Nigerian husband as jealous, controlling, and verbally abusive. She also claimed that he threatened to kill her because she wanted to stay in Texas. Eventually, their relationship became so strained that she changed her phone number and cut all communication because she was worried that Ayula would actually follow through on his threat. Meanwhile, his studies were put on hold in 2012 due to visa issues and allegations that he stole another student's iPad. Later that year, university police found him loitering on campus and acting suspiciously. The officer's report noted that he was disheveled and appeared to be homeless. Then, in 2014, he was a suspect in a sexual assault that purportedly occurred in a northern suburb of Logan, Utah. The alleged victim decided not to pursue charges, but despite visa issues, possible homelessness, and a harrowing run-in with the law, Ayula managed to join the Utah National Guard. But ironically, he never went through basic training and was discharged in mid-June of 2015 due to an undisclosed medical or physical fitness issue. Ayula eventually resumed his studies at Utah State University in 2015, but he never graduated. During this period of his life, he spent much of his time lifting weights, writing a novel, and doing everything he could to get his budding modeling career off the ground. Even so, more allegations of sexual misconduct arose in mid-March of 2018 when a woman that he met on a dating app claimed that he assaulted her at his home. According to her, they were watching television when he began kissing her and touching her inappropriately. She tried to get away, but she said that he used his body weight to pin her to the couch and bit her. Also, Ayula and Tanisha were officially divorced in January of 2019, and by then he had become increasingly frustrated with his inability to find a suitable companion. Even so, he managed to finish his novel, Forge Identity, in which a murder victim's body is burned to cover up the crime. By the spring of 2019, Ayula was spending more and more time trying to connect with women on various dating apps and websites. However, neither his motives nor his intentions were particularly pure. 
Later that year, he contacted a local contractor to ask about having a soundproof room built under his front porch. This was a strange request, but the contractor became even more suspicious when Ayula told him that he also wanted a fingerprint scanner installed on the door and head height hooks anchored to the walls. Ayula said that he just wanted a secret place to drink alcohol away from his Mormon girlfriend, but the contractor didn't buy this story and turned down the job. At the same time, Ayula hired a woman named Tara Chatterton to clean his home. She found it unsettling that there were so many cameras in the house. Most of them pointed at the beds. How many cameras did he have in the house and where were they placed? I figured around eight to 10. Wow. Um, but there was one in every single room for sure, but there was several in the master bedroom. And where were the cameras facing in the master bedroom? Towards the bed. She says the accused killer specifically asked her to bring her 12-year-old daughter Cherish with her when she cleaned the house. Tara says AJ had a certain charm, but reminded her of notorious serial killer Ted Bundy. He creeped me out in a Ted Bundy type way. It also creeped her out that Ayula kept asking her to bring her 12-year-old daughter when she came to clean his house. She ended up quitting after just one day, and in an interview with Inside Edition, she said that Ayula reminded her of famous American serial killer Ted Bundy. The trial was originally scheduled for mid-March of 2020, but prosecutors asked for a postponement because they needed more time to sort through their evidence and turn what they had over to the defense attorney, Neil Hamilton. On October the 7th of 2020, Ayula Ajahi officially pled guilty to first-degree aggravated murder and third-degree desecration of a human body in connection with Mackenzie Lewick's death. Mackenzie's family, friends, and the community at large were all eager to see justice done. Since Ayula had already confessed to the horrible crime and pled guilty, the proceedings were little more than a legal formality. During the trial, Ayula readily confirmed what he had already told investigators. But this time, he was face to face with Mackenzie's friends, family members, and sorority sisters in a packed and emotionally charged courtroom. Even so, he remained relatively stoic and unemotional, and no detail was left out no matter how unpleasant it was for Mackenzie's loved ones to hear. In exchange for his guilty plea, prosecutors dropped the aggravated kidnapping and obstruction charges and agreed not to seek the death penalty. District Attorney Sim Gill said the arrangement would give Mackenzie's parents some measure of justice and closure without having to sit through an excruciating and needlessly drawn-out trial. Ayula was also charged with 19 counts of sexual exploitation of a minor because police found pornographic photos of young people while searching his home after Mackenzie's disappearance. However, those charges were ultimately dismissed. Just a few weeks later, on October the 23rd of 2020, 3rd District Judge Vernice Tease sentenced Ayula to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus five additional years for desecration of the body. The defendant apologized to Mackenzie's family after the sentence was handed down, but many of those present didn't feel that his emotions were genuine. In a particularly poignant moment, Mackenzie's father described his daughter as a sweet and amazing young woman who had the whole world laid out in front of her before Ayula robbed her of her future. Another family member described Ayula simply as a monster. A clear motive for the crime was never established, but according to District Attorney Gill, Ayula murdered Mackenzie just to see what it felt like to take a human life. After the trial, Kara Barbie speculated that Mackenzie might still be alive if society was not so uptight and judgmental about what she had been doing on the night that she went missing. Had her actions been more socially acceptable, she may have felt comfortable telling someone where she was going and who she would be with. And if Ayula knew that her friends and family members were aware that she was with him that night at his home, things could have turned out very differently. Lyft driver Michael Canada also did a lot of soul-searching after the horrible crime came to light. 
He wondered if he could have done anything different on that night, but ultimately concluded that he simply provided a service Mackenzie requested and that there was no indication that anything was amiss. Today, Ayula Ajayi is incarcerated at the Utah State Prison in Draper, Utah, where he should remain until he draws his last breath. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.